Hey, everybody, and welcome to the first show of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime with me, Marshane Kenny. A lot of you recognize me as that super fan for Southern Miss Athletics, and a lot of you know me or remember me as that linebacker from back in the 90s who was a high-energy guy. A big goal of mine was to get the crowd real hyped up uh, when we made big plays. So thank you so much for joining this first show. Some things to expect on this show. We're going to have a lot of solid interviews. You'll recognize a lot of those faces that I interviewed, that's for sure. Uh, we're going to have some people from the past and the present tell stories on why Southern Miss means so much to them. Uh, I definitely uh, want a lot of fan engagement, so I'll read some comments and questions from the show. That'll be a big goal of mine, a lot of interaction. Uh, and then fourth up, I'm going to have a hot take of uh, the week or the day or whatever's going on in Southern Miss athletics that I think is uh, feel, uh, that I feel is worth talking about. So, And we're going to call that segment, which is next up, Marshant's Rant. So... Right now, Southern Miss men's basketball is having a solid season. And in recent times, you know, we haven't had a lot to cheer about for Southern Miss basketball. Uh, but before the season, uh, head coach Jay Ladner uh, had me come talk to the team. And uh, I was very honored to do that. And I stayed afterwards and watched practice. And uh, as I was watching practice, I, I saw a lot of new faces, even on the coaching staff, uh, obviously the players. And I looked at some of my friends who were sitting with me, and I said, man, this product looks pretty dang good. I think we're on to something. And, uh, well, look at us now. Uh, we're 21-4, and four, first place in the Sun Belt Conference West, and we got a big game coming up at Reed Green Coliseum this Thursday against the Raging Cajuns. Uh, I know they're hyping it up. Should be a, a very hyped event, and a lot of people should be showing up from the area. Looking forward to that one for sure. So big-time kudos to head coach Jay Ladner, the program, and everything they're doing over there. And also, let me mention the women's basketball team, too. Coach McNeilis recently got her 300th win for her career. So great job, ladies, over there on the hardwood as well. Uh, so now I want to get into the interview session uh, of, of this program. And for my first interview for this program, anyone, anywhere, anytime, I, I couldn't think of anyone else to start the show off with. He's a man who gave me a scholarship back in 1993 to, to play football at Southern Miss and to find out what this black and gold was all about. Uh, so enough about uh, that. Let's get into this first interview with a man who means so much to so many people in the Southern Miss world. One of the greatest college football coaches of all time, Jeff Bauer. And what an honor it is for me right now to have on my first uh, interview for anyone, anywhere, anytime. A uh, guy who means the world to me, uh, former football head coach at Southern Miss, Jeff Bauer. And coach, thanks for being on. Marshan, it's always good to be on with you. Good to talk to you. Well, I appreciate that, man. And for anybody that doesn't know, um, just your accolades just speak so many volumes. I mean, looking you up, Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame, Southern Miss Hall of Fame, the Conference USA Coach of the Decade in the 90s, 14 straight winning seasons, uh, 11 bowl games, four conference championships. I mean, Coach, it's, it's just non-stop accolades, and, and you're, it's just so awesome to have you on. So talk about maybe – just all, all, all those awards and honors that you did win. Well, I mean, that's, that's all nice, but you know, you, you, you know, I, I attribute all that to, you know, our coaches that we had here and, and most importantly, the players, uh, you know, we, we were fortunate to, you know, have a good coaching staff. They did a nice job recruiting. We were, you know, we kind of built from the, didn't go to the junior colleges a lot, but, high school and, and, uh, you know, built a team on development pretty much just trying to spec, trying to, uh, speculate and project kids, uh, that we did sign. I could go through so many of them that we had that, you know, weren't really recruited highly at all that became really good coaches and a number of them go on to the NFL, but, um, the players, uh, but it's, um, it's um it's good coaching, good players, and um, um it's all about people. When you hire good people and you surround yourself with good people, um good things will happen. No doubt about it, coach. And I, I saw a lot of it firsthand, obviously in the nineties, but you know, it all had to start somewhere, and that's Roswell, Georgia. So getting back to Roswell High School where you got started, I mean, you look there, you were success early, you're two-time state football champion, a two-time state basketball champion, a, a baseball state champion. I mean, you were the big man on campus starting early on. <laughs> well, uh, I played everything. Um, uh, you know, it was 
you know, when you, when you win that many state championships, again, it's the same thing. We, we had some good players and we were blessed to have a great coaching staff. Uh, it was a good time at Roswell. Uh, um, you know, my senior year, uh, I didn't play basketball my junior year and, uh, the co coach kind of recruited me right after we won the state championship, uh, my senior year. And, and I uh, went out and played basketball and uh, took me a few games where I, before I became a starter. But, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was, to me, I, basketball wasn't my best sport. Uh, I played it because I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the competition. And, and uh, but winning that state championship and, you know, the senior year was a special one because we won it in football, basketball and baseball. Uh, I don't think that's ever been done in in the state of Georgia. So that was tr that was quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I wanted to get in high school because winning started early for you. I mean, obviously, winning tradition you created around here. But what's unique is you know people know you as a quarterback as well uh, back in the seventies at Southern Miss, but you started at the University of Georgia. So how'd you go from Georgia to Southern Miss though after that year? Well. That's an interesting story. Some of it I won't share with you. Uh, <laughs> but I went to Georgia. It was the last year I signed there, and um, it was the last year they had freshman teams. So we played a freshman schedule. We only played five freshman games. Uh, we practiced by ourselves. We didn't practice with the varsity. Now, we did line up and, and scrimmage a couple times against the varsity. But uh, we had all our freshman coaches and – and um, we played a five-game schedule. I think we played played Clemson, Auburn, South Carolina, uh, Florida, and the Georgia Tech game was a Thanksgiving Day game that was uh, – I think it was a national TV game. Um, our varsity played the next game the next day. But um, things just didn't work out. I, you know uh, – I was going to sit on the bench. We had a quarterback there named Andy Johnson okay. um, who um, who started that year as a sophomore. And uh, if you know, if you follow football, you know, he was a, he was a running quarterback, uh, a decent thrower. Um, but, you know, I was probably realistically going to end up on the bench for a couple of years waiting for my opportunity to play. And I guess so much like kids now, you know, they want to play. So, you know, the transfer portal has made it it's a lot easier now than it was when I played. But Andy Johnson went on to the to the NFL as a running back and played eight or ten years with the Patriots. Uh, mm -hmm. He was that good a runner, and they ran a lot, of, a lot of option, which we ended up doing when I got here. I thought I was coming down here to throw the ball. Uh, we ran a lot of option, too. But, uh, you know, I decided to go ahead after my – my freshman year there to transfer and, and, um, you know, was contacted by a few schools and my dad and I visited Southern Miss and we really liked it. And I thought it was a great opportunity. There was competition here, but, and there's always going to be, that's good. But, um, I just felt like this was a great place. I fit in well. I liked the people and, and made the decision to transfer and, you know, after transferring, you know, as of now, not now, but as of then, you had to sit out a year. And, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And played on right. the scout team and practiced every day, but wasn't eligible to play in games. So it left me with three years of eligibility, and I was fortunate enough to, to be a starter all three years. Oh, yeah, looking back, I mean, you're considered one of the best quarterbacks ever at Southern Miss. I mean, you held records that hold up still to this day. Um Winning season. We didn't throw every... it very much like they do today, Marchand. Hey, but still, uh, records and stats still hold up, man. And uh, but but looking at, at those teams you were on, you you know you you were all South. You were team captain, MVP. Um, all three years you you played, you started uh, winning records, man. Started back then. So I mean, the winning continued from high school all the way to when you were playing. Uh, so tell me some stories about uh, the games or what have you from the seventies. Oh, man. Uh, well, <laughs> you one, know, <laughs> first of all, we didn't hardly play any home games. They were renovating M.M. Roberts Stadium. Right. I remember when I was being recruited in the transfer process, 
um, Coach Underwood, P.W. Underwood was the head coach, and he said, oh, by the time you're eligible after you red shirt year, we're going to have a brand new stadium and blah, 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 and here's who we're playing and this and that. Well, they started construction a little late, and um, I think my freshman, my sophomore year, um, we played it. We played at home three times in the old stadium, and then the next two years we were on the road every week. Yeah, so, it's one of the most amazing things, and you all won six and five and seven and four without playing a true home game. I mean, one of the most amazing things. You talk about grit. And so that's, that, there that's you go. hard to do. That's yeah. hard to do. Now we had some, some uh, two or three games that were so-called home games, but I think we played in Jackson one time. We played in Mobile uh, one time. I think we played my senior year. We played homecoming on the uh, Gulf Coast um, at a stadium there. Can't recall the name, um, but those were – not really home games. I mean, uh, but I mean, every, um, I got Debbie sitting over here with me. So she was a big part of that. She was, you know, of my life back then. We, we, we met when I was, uh, I guess my, my sophomore year when I became eligible yeah. was when we first met and she was a cheerleader. And uh, yeah, that, that's a great subject. I mean, you're the all-star quarterback. She's the cheerleader. It's a match made in heaven, man. And y'all are still a power <laughs> couple, power couple to this day. So you yeah, have more details how you met, if you don't mind. Well, she's wonderful most of the time. Now we did <laughs> play at Mississippi State one year. I got to tell you this story. Okay. You just triggered this. Uh oh. Um, we're playing at Mississippi State, and we're staying in um, Columbus uh, the night before the game. Debbie's up there. The cheerleaders are there. They're staying there also at the same hotel. We go to the game the next day, and somebody comes up to me at the stadium and says, um, Debbie is calling, and she can't find the keys to her car. Oh, good. He's at the hotel. <laughs> oh. So, Debbie, didn't they send a uh, – was it a helicopter? Yeah, they sent a helicopter to pick her up. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't bother her that I'm out there on the field, pregame warm up, and I got some of a cop coming up to me and say, saying, your, your girlfriend's stuck. Do you have the keys to the car? I said, no, I don't. Uh, why would I have the keys to the car? I went up there on the bus. She drove up there. But anyway, they helicopter her in. Um, wow. And uh, uh, I, I think we tied the game 10-10 with State, so uh, didn't put enough points on the board. I blame it on her. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We'll have to talk off camera about that game, too, a little bit more. But uh, That's man, not that's the awesome. only time that, she, that we had to get the police involved. Uh, one time we, we got her a police escort to Jackson. Wow. Um, and the lights were on. She was telling me the whole time they never stopped, had all the roadblocks at every intersection, this and that. So she's high maintenance, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Always That's has all... been high maintenance. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Man, you two together, I, I just love it, man. I can't, I can't get enough. That's awesome. Man. And what an awesome story. Like I said, you two, just a power couple in, in Hattiesburg. Oh, Always well, have been, thanks. always will be. So. You finish out at Southern Miss your playing career, and then you get to be a GA at Southern Miss. What was coaching right after, like, you know, coming from being the quarterback? It was good. You know, I I, um, I graduated, um, and I had an opportunity to be a – go with the Detroit Lions as a free agent. Okay. And I had to make a decision between that or, you know, start my – uh, so-called coaching career, uh, being a GA. And uh, I wanted to get a master's degree, and I wanted to coach. Okay. You know, I mean, sports were in my blood. That's all I'd ever done growing up. And and uh, so Bobby Collins offered me a grad assistant job, and and um, I took that and a uh, two-year stint of doing that. And Mac Brown uh, happened to be – he came with Bobby my senior year of new staff. Bobby took over the, the head job then, and Mac Brown, he hired as an assistant coach. 
And after my second year as a GA, Mac had left, Mac left to go to Memphis, take a, a job there. And Bobby offered me the, the wide receiver job. And um, so I was just finishing up my master's in business and uh, got offered a job. Debbie got upset with me. We were scheduled to get married. We did get married uh, in June. I took the I took the job I think in uh, February March I believe, and um, I took it. Bobby offered it. I accepted on the spot. Uh, called Debbie up. She thought I was going to take a job with my master's. I had mm-hmm. interviewed with some companies there, you know, in case coaching didn't didn't pan out. I didn't have an opportunity to do that, and I called her up and said guess what? I got a job. She said, good. Where are we going to move? I said, we're going to stay in Hattiesburg. Oh, she indeed. said, Hattiesburg. And I said, yeah, I took a job as assistant coach on the, on the, on the staff coaching the wide receivers. A lot of silence, Marshan. A lot of silence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's neat, man. She got over it and loved it. And, well, you know, we loved the coaching profession. We had, you know, a lot of great times and, and we love Hattiesburg. Oh, that's great. And a unique deal right there when you got right after your playing career in the Southern Miss. I mean, you had just finished playing quarterback and a quarterback named Reggie Collier is there. So how was it like, you know, interacting with Reggie Collier with two quarterbacks, you know, from a coaching uh, player perspective? Oh, it was fun. Um, You know, I coached the receivers the first couple of years and uh, then Bobby elevated me to the quarterback coach and and I had an opportunity to coach Reggie for two years. Mm. And um, wow, what an athlete. What a dominant, the most dominant football player I've ever seen on, on the football field. Um, you know, his he was a good passer, um, but he was a tremendous runner. Um, and, uh, you know, a chance to coach him. I remember we were, we were, um, we were playing, uh, I think it was Texas Arlington. It was a home game. And I'm in the box during the game with our, our offensive coordinator, Whitey Jordan. Um, and the opening, we get the ball on the 20-yard line, the first possession of the ball game, run a little dive option, a triple option. And, and um, you know, Reggie's job is to read the tackle, pull fullback dives, and if it's, you know, no give there, pull it, go to the defensive end and either pitch it or keep it, but attack the inside shoulder of the defensive end. Well, Reggie didn't attack the inside shoulder. The defensive end is there to play him, and he runs right by him, right by his face, and goes 80, untouched. Yeah. And and I'm saying, Dad gummit, you know, I might have used a little bit worse language than that. But, <laughs> and and um, I said, Reggie, and I got him on the phone. I said, Reggie, take it up inside to the inside shoulder and, you know, hey, take what he gives you. And we had a running back named Sammy Winder, pretty good. Pretty good. (laughs) Sammy was our pitch man, you know. And uh, so anyway, we get the ball back, and it's on the 20-yard line again. Mm -hmm. And Whitey said, calls the same play. And it's an instant replay. Reggie runs right by the defensive end's face goes 80 for a touchdown, and I'm saying, dang it, Reggie. Mm. Man, uncoachable guy won't go inside and make the DN. We've got mm. the pitch if we want it. And Whitey turns to me, and he says, Bauer, don't overcoach that boy. <laughs> and, and, and he was right. I mean, Collier had that kind of ability. Um, I know so often on some of our pass plays, you know, one, two in the progression, if nobody's open, hey, Reggie, pull it down and go. Uh, sometimes we only have one progression. Mm. Uh, pull it down, find a find a crack, and go. But he was. Uh, I, oh, I talked to so many defensive coordinators saying that you know he was the most difficult guy to game plan because you know of his ability to do both. You know, throw and run. And um, you know he was a um, big time athlete, big time player. Oh, what a cool dynamic you two uh, working together like that. So had fun with some... him and still and still see him and uh oh yeah. Wasn't a very good golfer that, that back then because I did play some golf wow. with him. And wow. uh stiff as a board. I said, I thought <laughs> you were a better natural athlete than this, but uh he's good now. I think oh, he's man. about a four or five handicap. All right, uh, look at Reggie. <laughs> yeah, he'd be giving me strokes now, Sam. 
<laughs> That's good stuff. So, so Southern Miss coaching uh, finishes up right there. You go to SMU, you go to Wake Forest as quarterback coach, but you get blessed. You know, Curly Hallman is the coach from 88 to 90 at Southern Miss, and you get an opportunity to come back to Southern Miss. So what's that like to just come full circle back to Southern Miss? Oh, it was, uh, it was, it was, you know, I wanted to be a head coach and, and, um, you know, um, made those moves, as you mentioned, SMU. And then I went to, uh, well, I came back with Curly and, and, um, you know, which was a, a great experience because we had Brett Favre and, um, yeah. you know, I, um, you know, I had Brett a sophomore and junior year and, um, you know, obviously what a talent and oh, what a competitor, <laughs> all the intangibles that you want. No, you know, no brainer that he was going to go on and have a lot of success. I remember talking to um, an NFL head coach. I can't remember who it was because I talked to so many of them um, approaching <laughs> draft day, uh, Brett's senior year. And, and, and I told one of them point blank, this guy's a no brainer, number one pick. Mm. And um, he didn't get picked number one. He got picked first in the second round, but goes on and has the career that we all know about. But, uh, you know, you don't get an opportunity in a, in a coaching lifetime. Very few have to coach a Reggie Collier and a Brett Favre. Wow. And, uh, you know, really blessed. And then was blessed to have some, um, probably not on that level, but some really, really good quarterbacks uh, throughout my head coaching career here. But I remember after the second year I left to go to Oklahoma State. Right. And uh, it was 1990, I think, right? Right. I 90. believe it okay. was 90. And, um, well, 89, I think I spent at Oklahoma State, and okay. I came back in 90. Okay. And, uh, but only spent about six months in, in Stillwater. We weren't very good. We won four games. They were on probation. Uh, I think we had 65 scholarships, uh, football players on scholarship, where you could have 85. Uh, but we won four games that year, and good experience. Oh, coach for Pat Jones. Um, a lot of respect for and learned a lot from and Curly leaves to go to LSU and get a call from Bill McClellan. I'm in Texas stadium mm. watching recruiting and watching the uh, Texas high school playoffs, um, the old Texas stadium. Um, and um, I get a, somebody comes in, Oh, over the, the PA system. Uh, will Jeff Bauer please go to the courtesy phone in the lobby or something like that? Huh. And so I get up and go out there. I said, what the heck is this? Who's calling me? You didn't have cell phones back then, Mark. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, I did have a car phone. I eventually got a car phone, um, the old plug-in type. Was it, was it mounted, one of those mounted ones, Coach? No, it was in a bag. <laughs> okay. It was in a bag, and, you know, you carried it with you everywhere you were going. To, uh, and uh, But anyway, I got a call. And uh, picked up the phone. It was Bill McClellan. Uh, and he, he said, uh, do you want to be our next head football coach? I had already come out here and interviewed, been through that that stage and everything. And Cur uh, Curly went to LSU right at that Curly point. Curly went to LSU yep. and and I said yes. And oh. um, in fact, um, I called Pat Jones up. Um, I can't remember, probably after that game, maybe I got back to the hotel and said I – I'm going to take the head job at Southern Miss. He said, that's great. And uh, he said, when are you going? And I said, well, they want me down there tomorrow. So um, I got to find a, you know, coat and tie and stuff like that to uh, do the press conference. And uh, he, he made a special trip to come down there. It's about a, I don't know, four hour ride from Stillwater and, and brought me a coat and tie. Debbie packed a bag for me and, she was coming too, and uh, I think we flew to, to Hattiesburg and accepted the job. That's fantastic. And the, the first game you coach is the 1990 All-American Bowl, Brett Favre's last game. And, um, I mean, that's that's your first game. And how neat was that, man? Because that's going to a bowl back then. It's not like now. There, 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 you know, tons of bowls out there. Going to a bowl game was a big deal. And um, yeah, it how was. was it your first game you're coaching a bowl? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I didn't get them there, but they they gave me an opportunity. I'd only been gone a year, 
mm-hmm. um, actually six months out of the program pretty much. And, and Bill said, do you want to coach the bowl game? And I said, I'd like to, I know all the players are most of them. And, um, um, and I said, you know, I'm going to need some holdover uh, on the staff and everything. And uh, Curly didn't take everybody. I think we had, Oh, probably getting ready for that bowl game, Marchant. Maybe four coaches that were holdovers that that didn't have an opportunity to go with Curly, and uh, but it was a great experience. It was, um, I think Brett said at that time set a record through for like three hundred yards in the right. game, and we got beat to a good North Carolina State team. It was close. Dick Sheridan was coach then, and uh, but it was a good experience. But I I just felt like it would be good for me to jump in there and coach that bowl game and uh, heck, get to know the players and go out and be involved in all the practices and, and um, you know, get to know the players that I didn't know really is what I was trying to say. And, uh, but it ended up, ended up good. It was a good experience and I'm glad I made that decision. No, oh, very neat. And, and obviously, I mean, I don't know where to begin then your, your career goes from 1990 to 2007. I mean, 14 straight winning seasons in there, four conference championships, 11 bowl games. You know, once again, you're the Conference USA coach of the decade of the 90s. I mean, accolades are just out there. I I don't even know where to pick up again. So I'm going to let you tell some stories maybe in there. Pick a a game or two or there's just so Mm -hmm. much, man. I wouldn't know know where to begin. (laughs) Yeah, we had some pretty good wins. And um, um, we played on the road a lot. A lot. Um, (laughs) You know, the old anyone, anywhere, anytime, uh, that's where it all started. Um, You know, you look at our non-conference schedule, it was, um, it's, it's not what it is today or it even has been in, in, in recent years, but I was all, I know I'd met with Bill, didn't do the schedule and Bill did, but he always sat down and ran things by me and, and um, I told him, I said, look, you, you load it up and, <laughs> and especially do it the first three games of the year because I, I really wanted to find out a lot about our football team. And I think you do that by playing, you know, really good competition. But it was, it was a lot of fun. I um, uh, wish we'd have had more home games. I think it was somewhere around 59, 60% of all the games I coached were on the road. And yeah. um, <laughs> um but Debbie's saying right now, who'd you play? Well, well, we played Alabama, Tennessee. We beat, <laughs> we beat Georgia. We had a win against Nebraska. We had a win against Alabama. I think we beat Auburn maybe a time. Oh, right, two. Auburn. Auburn. Um, you know, we beat LSU the only time we played them. And, Oklahoma um, State twice, Illinois twice. I mean, when yeah. you talk about names, Pitt, I mean, geez. Yeah. First, first year, I didn't do a very good job. And um, the second year, I think we went four and seven the first year. Um, and, and we had some pretty good players. We should have been better. We had some, well, I'll be very candid. We had some off the field issues uh, that affected the team. I had to make a lot of tough decisions. And, and uh, at the end of the year, uh, made a lot of moves and some of the guys that were there were no longer there the next year and some of them very good players mm-hmm. um but you know how you live and what you do off the field is awful important to me and we had some guys that just weren't willing to uh to follow the team rules so made a lot of tough calls in the next year it was probably the the least talented team that i ever coached in fact i know it was and we went seven and four, and I think three of those four losses were within a touchdown. I think it was Alabama, uh, maybe Florida State. I can't remember, Marsh. You know, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, I'm pretty sure. And y'all had Florida beat, I think, in Georgia. It was right there to the wire. Yeah, we Not had – well, actually, we had Florida. Um, we were down to touchdown, and uh, we were down four points, I think. I think they beat us 24-20, and we had the ball – First and goal at the 10 to win the game, and we mm. couldn't score. Um, but three of those games, other than Northern Illinois, you know, we win seven games and of the four losses. They were all, you know, three of them were to SEC teams and very close games and um, and not a very good football team, but a 
a team. I mean, a lot of guys that really played well together, um, you know, worked hard every single day. We had a great chemistry on the football team. And, you know, it's, it's not all, all the time about talent. Right. It, it's about getting a bunch of players that are really dedicated that, that want to win and do what it takes. And, uh, and then the following year, we, we took a step back um, from a win-loss standpoint. Uh, and then the LSU game, I think, was the turning point, really, in, in where it, we When Curly Holman's the head coach yeah. for LSU. <laughs> so was there extra motivation for you going into that game? I mean, that was my freshman year. We're 5-5 five and five and going for winning rec- record in Tiger Stadium. But Curly Holman's the coach for LSU. Yeah, not really any extra okay. I, I never really thought of, of things in those kind of terms, you know. Okay. Um, um, but it was a it was a big game. We, we started really playing playing well towards the latter part of the season. We had to win. We were five and five. We needed mm-hmm. to win for a winning season, and we go down there and, and beat them in a close game, and um, and that that I think was the turning point. We got a lot of confidence from that game. Uh, Everything was was good around here. The attitude, the, the you know, the the team, the chemistry. I use that word a lot, but um, from that point on, we were pretty darn good. And, well, uh, from that point, ninety four all the way to 90, 2007, That's fourteen straight winning seasons. That LSU game. A lot of people look at that as the turning point for the program, really kicking things off. You know, 95, 96, we get in Conference USA, finally getting to a conference and uh, getting to kind of that 97 season. So uh, Conference USA you know, was a big turning point for us. But you hit on something with um, chemistry. I mean, you dealt with a lot of characters. I think I might have been one of them, too. But <laughs> how do you get all these characters on the same page and build chemistry? How do you do that? That's magical for a coach to do that, man. I can't remember how we <laughs> did it. Uh <laughs> No, we had team rules and, you know, we had a, you know, a standard of conduct and, and, and uh, I didn't bend a lot, you know, I mean, uh, I was a second chance guy a lot, a lot of times, but there were certain things that, um, you know, if, if it was detrimental to your program and, and, um, you know, when, if it was somebody that really didn't need to be here, that, that, it, it wasn't good for us and, you know, going to make a change. And uh, yeah. you hate to do that, but you do what's best for the team. And, um, you know, um, sometimes, you you know, again, you just got to do that. Um, um, you, you know, you, you had said something about stories. I, I was going to bring up a, a story about Pete Antonio. Okay. Uh, do, you remember, do you play with Pete? Uh, walk me through Pete one more time. I think, in the story you get. Pete to. might have been a little bit after you. He came. Yeah, because I know these names sometimes. But yeah, and we had a lot of walk-ons. Um, you know, our staff did a great job recruiting. Um, you know, but, but give us a Pete, Pete story. Give us a Pete story. The Pete <laughs> story was that we're playing Tulane here in MM Roberts Stadium, mm-hmm. and we got like a three-touchdown lead, and it's in the fourth quarter, maybe early, something like that, and things are going good, and. Pete's a defensive tackle, and all of a sudden there's a little skirmish out there in the field, and things are getting a little heated, and then it turns out a little bit worse, and there are a few punches thrown and this and that. Well, when the dust settles, um, you know, flags fly and all that, and Pete and the two-lane player are ejected from the game for fighting, mm. and Pete's all fired up and pumped up. Pete was an intense guy. Mm-hmm. Good player, and and um, I'm sure he tried. To, I'm sure he hated to come over and meet me at the sideline, but he did. <laughs> and when he got there, I said, "Pete, what the heck happened?" He said, "Coach, he called me a effing Mexican," <laughs> and it was all I could do to bust out from laughing. I said, "Hit the bench, there, Pete." And I, I mean, I absolutely lost it after that. I laughed. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can't say the word, but an effing Mexican, Pete's Greek. Uh, oh goodness! And I told Pete, I said, "Those two lane guys. Uh, I don't know what that that academic requirement is to get in that school, but that guy, uh, he slid by somehow." Oh goodness gracious! Not cool, right there, man. <laughs> it's a fighting words. 
Oh, um, and I like Pete, and I talk to him occasionally, and he stays in touch. Uh, he's done extremely well. Really proud of him. That, that's fantastic. And um, so, yeah, kind of mid-90s right there, things are kind of rolling along for us, getting to be top 20. The 97 season, I'd love to bring up. Uh, our first two games are playing at Florida, defending national champions, almost get them. It was my senior year. Uh, Illinois, you know, we win that game on national TV. Things are rolling along. We're looking pretty good. You got things cooking. Um, you know, you were a father figure to a lot of us. I mean, especially me, you know, I was, you know, my story is raised in a boy's home, had no brothers, sisters, and, you know, Southern Miss was a total family atmosphere to me. Um, your daughter, Kristen, I mean, she, she was special to the team. She's like a little sister to all of us. Um, you know, the week of the, Illinois, after the Illinois game, you know, um, you get, you get horrible news of her, of her passing, um, you know, this is where, you know, you, you take on a deeper, newer meaning to a lot of people. And um, you, you, you treated us like family and, and, and stood there and still coached us despite, despite le- dealing with one of the toughest things a father can deal with. And um, But, you know, the loss of Kristen um, in that 97 season um, and you, you still being a father figure, coach, mentor to all of us. I mean, if you, if you talk about just that week. Oh, the hardest week I've ever been through in my life and my wife. And my youngest daughter, Stephanie, it was, uh, mm, uh, I mean, it's, you know, I could say a lot of things, but it's hard to explain. It was, um, um, oh, it, it was bad, bad. And, um, you know, things like that happen, um, you know, but when I, you know, when you, you, you think about things, uh, you know, i I thought about, obviously, my family was most important to, you know, to, to kind of get through or help get through that time. Um, but I had a job, too, and I had a responsibility, and you guys. And, um, you know, we had a game coming up. I think it was Nevada mm-hmm. that we Nevada. were playing at home. And um, I wasn't a very good coach that week, I don't think. Um, but I had to get back involved. I know – trying to remember exactly but I know we had the funeral and I was on like a maybe a Monday or so which was I think an off day for us I'm not sure but um obviously practice Tuesday and and uh, you know some people recommended I maybe take a couple of days before I came back but I really wanted to go back and and um you know, that was, um, I think, the best thing to do for the football team and the best thing to do for me because I got around you guys and I loved you guys. And, boy, you all loved me back and helped me through that tough time, and it was nothing like it. Um, I consider myself fortunate to have a situation like that, to jump back in after a tragedy uh, like that. And, um, um you know, I, again, it, it was a it was a tough week, and um, I don't know how much coaching I did really, but um, you know, it, it was. I can remember Marchant coming out on the field, um, and seeing guys, and so many of y'all came up and and hugged me, and it meant so much to me. I still get emotional about about that. Um, that's one of the things I'll never, ever forget is, is walking on that field through that gate and, um, and, you know, seeing what, seeing you guys and, and, um, I remember everything, all the, the things you all did and made me feel so good. And even though I threw out the whole practice guys coming up, even if it was a pat on the butt or a hug or something like that, um, um uh, meant so much to me it helped me a lot and um but it helped helped me to just getting on the field and jumping back into thick things maybe keep my mind off of this for a little while and uh you know a rough week but a good week and you guys delivered and good win for us too yeah you know like i said when your leader your father figures hurting man we had to rally for you and we did and you know, you hold this, the dearest place in my heart to this day. 
uh, everything you stood for and everything you did for us. And uh, you and Debbie are just special people, everybody in the community. So, um, you know, never forget that week. And then, you know, we yeah. went on and had a really great season in the Liberty Bowl. I got a great picture of you and Stephanie walking off the field, uh, your daughter, Stephanie. And, um, you know, it, it just culminated with a, with a great end to the season. And, um, you know, you almost think Kristen was looking down and, and smiling. There's no doubt. And that's the first I, I thought of her when that game was over and Debbie came out and Stephanie came out and boy, that was a, that was a, um, that was a great moment for us. Um, and what a, what a football team that was too. Um, uh, I, I think the best team that we had of all the years that I coached was that nine. Well, I, I won't game. argue with that coach. I won't. Argue I remember that. Walt Harris, <laughs> the head coach at Pitt told me after the game, he said, Jeff, and they were in the Big East, I think, at the time, and won the Big East, and uh, a lot of good teams in that in that league at that time. And he said, "You guys can beat anybody in the country. You're the best team we played all year long." And uh, I'll never forget that. And uh, when you go back and look at that team too, I think John Cox had told me that they off of that team there were 17 players drafted into the NFL. Yeah. Um, but at that time of the year, we kind of had things rolling a little bit, you know, we were, we were, um, you know, things were good. Football was really a lot, a lot of fun. Coaching was a lot, a lot of fun when you win and you got good players and you go out and every day was a good practice. And, um, so I, I'll never forget that football team and all the good players on that team, Pat Sertan, yourself, who Latrell. Um, I mean, T.J. Slaughter, uh, Delius Thomas. I mean, it's he, just Gideon. Perry Phoenix. Uh, <laughs> good <laughs> Lord. How many sit-downs did I Harold have? Trump. God, I love him to death, but the guy could never be on time. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he would do something. Nothing, nothing ever major. But, you know, he's one of those kind of guys where, you know, you, you chew on him a little bit for doing the wrong thing, put out a little discipline, and 10 minutes later, he just couldn't help it. You, you, no. You're hugging him up. You love him. You mm. could, I couldn't stay mad at the guy. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh. golly, you go through all those teams, Gideon and Pinkston and Lee Roberts and Harold Shaw and – uh, Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a special time to be a Golden Eagles. They still talk about it to this day, and – like I said, during that run, 14 straight winning seasons. I mean, four conference USA championships, 11 bowls during your run. And, um, and, and you recognize to this day, which is so cool, the college football playoff committee recently, a few years ago, I mean, they, they vote on, I think it was 13 members to pick the college football teams uh, to, be go, to go into the college football playoff. You're one of those members picked out of all the landscape of college football. What was that like, man? I mean, that, that had to be cool. It was, it was, um, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I needed something to do to, to, uh, keep me busy during football season. And thank goodness that, that came about. And I spent three years, you, it's a three year term and I did my three years, but I really enjoyed it. And, and, uh, you know, I traveled up there, watched a whole lot of football games on TV. They assign you conferences each year, different conferences and, and um, um, you watch more games than just your conference, but your emphasis was on, on the conferences that, that were assigned to you. And going out to Dallas, I think I left, um, went out on, when I go out, Debbie, Sunday? I think I went out on Sundays, flew out of Jackson or the coast and, and um, got there. Uh, and our, we started our, our meetings Monday and deliberated all Monday and then, Tuesday up to lunch and, you know, had the final 25, top 25 uh, that we voted on. And mm -hmm. uh, just a great chance to be around some some good people. Some of the head coaches that were on the committee, uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, yeah. Condoleezza <laughs> sat next to me. She was there my first year and sat next to her. And uh, what a what a terrific person she was. Uh but we had a lot of good times and, and, um, you know, that was, uh, that was a great experience in my life. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, um, proud that I had an opportunity. Absolutely. And then, like I said, well-respected in the college football landscape, considered one of the greatest college football coaches of all time, everything you did. I, I think any coach listening to this might like this question. 
what's some advice you give to a coach, maybe young up and coming coach to be su successful in, in, in dealing with uh, the college football landscape nowadays? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> if I, I don't know how to deal with the current landscape. Uh, <laughs> we were just talking about it um, not long ago. How do you, you know, to me, the major job, I mean, it's always been a, a responsibility managing your roster, but how mm -hmm. do you do that now mm -hmm. as a head football coach when, you know, with the transfer portal and guys coming in and out? I know I talked to Will Hall last year at one time mm -hmm. um, and called him. He and I touched, we touched mm -hmm. base on a regular basis. And, um, and I said, what are you doing this week? Aren't you supposed to be out recruiting? He said, yeah, we're supposed to be out doing our, our you know, the junior recruiting. And he mm -hmm. said, but, I'm going to keep the staff in and we're going to re-recruit our players, you mm. know, uh, because of that transfer portal. Just, you mm. know, be yeah. around your kids, talk to yeah. them, get a feel for, you know, somebody leaving or not, you know, but mm. you want to hold on to what you have. Uh, but at the same time, you need to, um, you know, if things happen and you got guys leaving, um, you got to have a backup plan. And right. it's difficult now, I'm sure, as a head coach to manage a roster with guys leaving. I think the transfer portal opens up again um, after spring football practice, and you're going to see another wave of guys go. And yeah, sure. that's more headaches for the head coach. Uh, yeah. I didn't have to deal with that, thank goodness. But, uh, no, it's it's totally a different landscape now. It's, uh, it's changed the NIL. I like that for the players. I think it's a little bit out of control. I think there need to be needs to be some rules set okay. and some limitations set. But you know, I'm from the old day, Marchant, when we got the fifteen dollar laundry check. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, the, the, was that just the? If, if you were a scholarship athlete, you were eligible to get a fifteen dollar, and they called it oh, the laundry okay. check, <laughs> a, a month, once a month, and we thought that was good money. Uh, <laughs> of course, you could buy gas for like 40 cents a gallon back then, too. So, uh, yeah. you know, we'd go further than it would today. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, – it's it's a – it's a, I was talking to somebody about that Florida quarterback here recently. Not Florida, but he a, – a, a recruit that had committed and had a $1.3 million mm -hmm. NIL deal. Wow. That Florida eventually reneged yeah. on. Don't know the, the story I behind that. that. Yeah, That's but – um, but I, I think one of the things too, you're asking about just helping young coaches. I, you know, I, for the most part, a lot of times had a young staff and, um, you know, you got so many responsibilities as a head coach, but I was a young coach at one time. And I remember Matt Brown really helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, some of the other coaches on the staff, uh, Whitey Jordan, uh, why was, Oh, Lord, Whitey and I sat up in the press box for years mm -hmm. calling plays, and uh, but I was very close to him, and uh, I think a head coach has got that responsibility. And, uh, um, right, you know, yeah. it's a rewarding profession. Absolutely. Um, coach, kind of getting a little bit of a close here. Uh, you know, you're a beloved figure in the Southern Miss world. I mean, you know, people just love you, want to bring up your name. Uh, Not what, all what, the time was I. Well, you know, when I, and I was around telling me, they, around me, I remember they, the Rice game. <laughs> we were down to our third team quarterback, uh, and um, um, we play Rice out here, and we throw. We got six. We turn it over six times in the game. We drop a two point conversion at the end of the game to win the game. We ended up having to play our backup quarterback who had not even practiced all week mm -hmm. because the third teamer got hurt. Anyway, they had four sale signs in my yard after the game. So oh, I'm not full of it all the time. Oh, that's that's part of it. Well, you know, look, looking back, maybe there were moments here or there. I mean, shoot, we lost some games in the nineties, but man, looking back, the body of work, it, it you know, it, it, it's, it speaks for itself. So, uh, is there is there like a closing message you want to say for the Southern Miss fans who'll be watching this? Because uh, I know this is one of those you might be interested in. Oh, I would just close a message. First of all, I'd just like to say thanks for the, all the support. Um, it was great, and I had a you know I had so much enjoyed my career, and what a better not a better place to live than Hattiesburg. But you know, 
all the, you know, the, the friendships and this and that, and the, thanks to the people that, that, that supported our program. And we need more of them to come out, March in. I think we got, I know we got the right guy uh, at the helm right now in Will Hall. I like Will. I like what he's doing. I like that he's, he's um, um, a lot of the same philosophies that, that, that I had. Uh, go recruit high school players and develop them. And, you know, so many of the guys that we had, not, like we talked about, not highly recruited, um, but, you know, you develop in a year or two, they become really, really good players. And, and I think that's what you've got to, got to do here. I think we went a little heavy on, um, on the junior college recruiting. I did some, but, and I think you have to some. Uh, for immediate needs. The transfer portal helps with that now. But um, I think Will's going to do a great job for Southern Miss, and we need to fill that rock up. Uh, you know, even when we were so good in 97, I looked at some of the, the attendance the other day. Uh, it was pretty good, but it wasn't what it ought to be. And, right, uh, right. Well, we, we just need to uh, – people need to get behind Will Hall and, and support this program. It's uh, But it's on the rise. I think we got the right guy. Yeah, that, that's great closing words. I believe in Coach Will Hall, too. And, you know, that passionate Southern Miss fan base should come back in full force. We keep winning. So, But, Coach Bauer, I mean, you know, I, I was doing this uh, show, and it was a no-brainer for my first inter interview to be with you. You meant so much to me. You still mean so much to me. Uh, you taught me so much, and you touch you touch thousands of lives. So uh, thank you very much for being the first guest here on Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime. Anything for you, Marshant, and um, oh. I've really enjoyed this. Good, good to visit with you. Yes, sir, always. Thank you. To the top. <laughs> All right, Chant. I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoyed that interview with Coach Bauer, a man who means so much to my life, even to this day. So hopefully you enjoyed that interview right there. Uh, next up, we're going to have another familiar face to a lot of Southern Miss fans. Uh, it's going to come from a guy who played in the NFL for years. He won the Connerly Trophy while at Southern Miss for being the, the best college football player in the state of Mississippi. Uh, he was Conference USA Defensive Player of the Year. I mean, I mean, literally one of the greatest to ever wear the black and gold. A lot of you know him. A lot of you love him. Uh, here's a story about leadership at an early time in his career at Southern Miss from legendary linebacker Rod Davis. What up, what up, what up? This is Rod Davis, baby. Appreciate you, Marshane, for having me, man. Uh, he just wanted to give me a quick story. I'm going to take it back to 2001. Uh, it's coming off a 2000 year where we beat LaDamian Thomason and uh, TCU in a uh, GMAC Bowl. Uh, had a good game. Got all bowl team, you know, made freshman All-American. You know, coming into that next year, 2001, I just want to play my role, do my job, and, and be there. But the first meeting, defensive meeting, Coach Tyrone Nix got up and said, man, we need our leaders to step up and lead this team if we want to be great like we were last year. So, you know, I started looking around, man. The leaders need to step up so we can uh, get this thing going. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm saying to myself. And as I turn back, Coach Tyrone look, Nix is looking dead at me and uh, Chad Williams. And he said, y'all are the leaders. Y'all are the returning two starters that, uh, that, that played the most football. And I was like, well, man, hold on. That ain't the that ain't what the role I want. I just want to play my role. I just want to do my job at middle linebacker and, and, and just go make tackles. I ain't trying to really lead nobody. It was like, you know, after that meeting, he brought me in there and said, man, we need you. We need the leaders to step up. We need guys to, uh, to, to look at you toward leadership and doing the things the right way. You and Chad got to lead us back to greatness, man. And, uh, it was one of those humbling things, but I was scared. I, I, I was I was very scared, man, because in my freshman year, I just had to play my role, and now they getting thrust into a leadership role, man. So it was very demanding, but uh, it was very fun, and I and I appreciate Coach Tyrone Nix and Jeff Power, you know, empowered me with that, and it 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 jumped. I, I, I guess my career because I started thinking about more about the team than myself and that helped me become a better player and then that be, helped me become a better teammate. Southern Miss to the top, baby. Appreciate you. Out. Thank you, Marshank. What a great story from Rod Davis. Thank you so much for sending that into the show, Rod. Uh, I said earlier in the show, we're going to have a lot of fan interaction. Going to try to get to your comments, questions, whatever you have about the show. And uh, on Twitter recently, I asked the Southern Miss Nation, I said, 
What do you love most about Southern Miss? And I had a lot of comments come in. I really appreciate that. I can't answer all of them, but I picked four that I think really uh, encompass uh, what Southern Miss is all about and what we love about Southern Miss so much. And first up, Attack Eagle commented, the community aspect, easy to get to know a lot of people from all ages. Everybody is family from the top down. Our leaders, coaches get to know the people that make up Southern Miss. It's not a business like a lot of schools these days. As Coach Will Hall says, it's real here. Love that comment, Attack Eagle. Next up, Avery Nobles retweeted something that Southern Miss men's basketball player DeAndre Pinckney tweeted recently after a home game. Uh, DeAndre said, after the game yesterday, I gave away a signed pair of game shoes to a kid, and I could just see the excitement on his face. I would have never been in the position to do that if I would have been anywhere else. Thankful for it all. Great words, DeAndre Pinckney. Uh, and you're my wife's favorite player. We love to watch you play, man. Appreciate all you do. Uh, next up, Lori Brechtel added why she loves Southern Miss so much. Here in Mississippi, even in high school, there is such peer pressure to go to root for other state schools. No shade to them in parentheses, what she puts. As a natural result, USM is made of audacious people that intentionally choose not to follow a crowd. My kind of people. Love those comments, uh, Lori. Southern Miss is my kind of people for sure. Uh, and then Jason Bailey, many of you know him of the To The Top Talk podcast, which is a great show. Uh, he says it's been 100 years or so of never being given a chance and 100 years or so of proving them wrong. The fight, the grit, the salty ass Southern Miss attitude. It's real and it's beautiful. And it is a very beautiful thing. Great comments and appreciate all those comments. Keep sending them in. Uh, and and kind of now we're getting to the end of the show. And that's it for the first show of anyone, anywhere, anytime. And I uh, appreciate you tuning in. And all I ask, help spread the word about the show. You know, hopefully you like what you saw. So uh, until next time, until every Tuesday from here on out, as always, Southern Miss to the top. Thanks again for tuning into the show. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment. Join us next Tuesday when I talk to Southern Miss head baseball coach Scott Berry and Southern Miss baseball great Trey Sutton.